Hello, I'm Marnie Hurst, NRD with the School of Information. Welcome to the seminar. Uh, before I say anything else, I have to remind you that this event is being live streamed and recorded and may be hosted on the web. If you ask any questions or make comments, they may be included in the live stream and recording. All right, uh, that's done. <laughs> it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jevin West. He's a visiting associate professor here at the iSchool. In his regular life, he's a professor at the University of Washington, an associate professor in the information school, as well as an adjunct in the computer science and engineering department at UW. Uh, he's the co-founder and the inaugural director of the Center for an Important Public at UW, aimed at resisting strategic misinformation at promoting an informed society and strengthening democratic discourse. Uh, Jevin received his BS and MS in biology at the University of Utah and his PhD in biology at UW. And his, wet, his Professor West research and teaching focus on the impact of data and technology on science with a focus on slowing the spread of misinformation. And while at the iSchool, he's teaching not one, but two courses, one based on his book, Calling Bullshit, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World, which helps non-experts question the numbers, data, and statistics with, without requiring an advanced degree. And I have to say, I spend so much of my time lecturing, not using swear words, and, and yet I just did. Um, and the second course is Misinformation in the Era of Chat GPT, which surveys the challenges in policy, technology, and research. So we're really, really grateful to have him here enlivening the conversation. And today he's going to talk about disinformation in science. So let's welcome him. Well, thank you so much, Marty. And thanks to all the students and faculty. I'm having an amazing time. When I looked at the calendar just the other day, I, I was kind of sad. It's going by too fast. I want to stay longer. So I will maximize my time here. So um, please uh, reach out anytime. It's so great to see so many faces. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about a topic that is kind of hard for me to talk about because I am a huge fan of science. I have always been a huge fan ever since I was a little kid. In fact, one of the first places I've been going to are all the museums here with my kids. I absolutely love science, but I've been spending much of my research career over the last half to a full decade thinking about this issue of misinformation, and I couldn't not uh, start focusing on the ways in which misinformation is impacting science as well. But let me get started with why science is so cool, just so that uh, we don't end uh, on a sour note. So um, as we all know, uh, you know, science is, is, a, is a wonderful mode of inquiry that's uh, led to amazing discoveries, like discoveries that happened on this campus. In fact, I'm all, as I'm walking across campus each day, I'm thinking, what magical thing is happening right now at Berkeley? Because this was one of many. Of course, science is built on the shoulders of giants and involves many different individuals and organizations. So this is not a one person show, but certainly one of the major players is a faculty member here at Berkeley. And to be able to come up with the technology to precisely cut DNA in places that allow us to treat certain diseases and, and use the same techniques that bacteria do to defend themselves against viruses. It is magical. It's remarkable. Okay, that's all I'm gonna really say good about science. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so most of the rest of the talk will uh, center around this issue that my colleagues and I have been focused on over the last several years. So this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention, I have never mentioned this in a talk about misinformation in science, that this paper arose from a talk that I gave a few years ago, actually right before the pandemic at the University of Irvine. It was something called the National Academy of Science Colloquium, and guess who sponsored that? Anyone want to make a guess? Anyone want to make a guess? They have a very famous talking or a speaking colloquium. It is... The National Academy of Sciences author, Sackler, author and Sackler colloquium advancing the science of practice science communication. For those who don't know the Sacklers, the Sacklers are the family behind the large opioid crisis that you may be aware of, where there is plenty of misinformation in science. So it's, I had to sort of insert this uh, irony into this talk that the talk I gave at the time in April 2019 with the rise of misinformation in and about science which the Sackler Colloquium sponsored. And I remember at the top, there was a sign sitting right here, and it was a Sackler Colloquium. It kept falling, there were people running out and trying to fix it. And it was sort of foreshadowing what was soon to come. 
What's interesting though about that particular issue, since we're on the topic, I'll talk about some interesting things that we see in science often around these particular issues. So one of here you're looking at a paper called The Addiction Rare in Patients Treated with Narcotics. The length of the paper is basically what you're reading right now. That's about it. Yet it has been cited many, many, many times over uh, the last several decades, basically supporting the use of narcotics as a, uh, as, a, as a form of treatment that's not addictive. Now, there was no real research, but it continues to be cited. In fact, there's been some nice analysis looking, some, uh, someone actually went through and looked at all of the citations in affirmative and negative and in critical forms. As you'd expect, most of them were in the affirmative. So here you have over 70% cited as evidence that addiction was rare in patients treated with opioids. And over 80% did not note that the patients in the letter were hospitalized at the time that they received this. And one thing I want to note, it has become so problematic, what well, was so problematic, problematic in the field, it's finally slowed down, that the New England Journal of Medicine put a lot, tiny little blue box here. And they've been starting to do this. I mentioned this in my class to my students that we can do better than little blue boxes with the same color of the journal. But for reasons of public health, readers should be aware that this letter has been heavily and uncritically cited as evidence that addiction is rare with opioid therapy. And then you look at this particular article. Now, that's a pretty archaic way of trying to correct the record. And just talking to one PhD students out there, this will be interesting to talk more about. In fact, the one example I'm going to give is, is kind of a rare citation. There's a lot uh, of work going on looking at citations, citing papers in the affirmative after they've been retracted. But here is one I'm putting up here because it really matters. This is an oncology journal. And what the authors found were that not over 90% of the articles cited retracted articles subsequent to retraction. And so that's the kind of issue that we're dealing with in science. And I'm not even going to go into all the issues around agnotology, which is an interesting uh, topic all by itself. In fact, I've given entire lectures just about this. This is a, basically the study of how uh, you know, science itself can be weaponized uh, against itself to uh, sort of induce doubt into issues like smoking, et cetera, et cetera, climate change. And this is a, one of the famous photos of a senator um, using sort of these methods. But I wanna talk about two kind of questions that all have really concerned me and what motivate me to study these kinds of things. And of course, it relates to what I just talked about, this idea that um, there are falsehoods that's, that can settle, how, how, you know, how often, how many are there, how often, and how do they get canalized, that's one issue. But I want to like raise uh, ourselves into even higher levels of scientific thinking and really think about the epistemic blind spots, the types of things that we will never solve given our current norms, institutions, and methods. These are the kinds of things I'm really interested in studying because I care about the work at places like this university. But of course, there are all sorts of nuances to these questions. I'll note two of them in the bottom question. First of all, falsehoods. Falsifiable information is actually pretty small when you look at the large uh, pool of information that's out there. So we have to include things like misleading information, cherry picking, et cetera. And it turns out that that is a much larger, but also a much larger pool, but also a much harder thing to study. And also, by the way, in fact, I'm talking to a Washington Post uh, journalist today about this exact issue. How do you measure falsehoods in science? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Where are we? Turns out it's a very hard question to answer. So if anyone can help answer that question, that would be super useful. Now, what I've been doing over the last many years with my colleagues is spending most of my time in the underbellies of the internet. Now, most of my students do most of this work um, and it can be challenging work on your psyche. In fact, we have rules in our center about spending too much time by yourself studying this kind of content because it can really be disorienting. And it's something that I didn't take as serious early on in studying this, but now I'm taking it very, very serious. Um, and the work in misinformation more generally on things like elections, on the pandemic, has led me to think a lot about the institution that I care very much about. And it makes me reflect on this particular, one of my favorite paintings, this is Narcissus from Carvaggio, where we tend to fall in love with our reflection. So Narcissus here like, was so in love with his his, his beauty and his looks, he just couldn't come away from the pond and died basically falling in love with himself. And I think sometimes in science, I feel like we're that way as we view society's engagement with science. So I am gonna talk about misinformation about science, 
but I want to make sure that we're talking about misinformation in science. In fact, I'm spending more time thinking about misinformation in science and even about. And let me give you an example of something literally hot off the press. In fact, I'm a little hesitant to show this, but I've thought through this over the last couple of days. I am going to show it, but I want to make sure that everyone understands that a process needs to happen before we make too much ju judgment. In fact, one thing I always remind my students is something called Hanlon's razor. <laughs> Excuse me, don't jump to assuming malice. Winning confidence is better. That's one thing. But also, <laughs> don't assume uh, incompetence when even honest mistake can occur. Okay, I'm going to show you this. Here's a journal article um, that is published by a recently hired dean at a major public university. I'm not going to give you the details because I, again, want the process to work its way out. I want you to look carefully at this particular article, um, Using Science to Minimize Sleep Deprivation that May Reduce Train Accidents. Our recent study has the premise that both humans and flies sleep during the night and awake during the day, and both species require a significant amount of sleep each day when the neural systems are developing specific activities. This trait is shared by both species. And then there's a few more sentences. And that's the end of the paper. There are a whole bunch of papers by this individual who is now the dean of a major engineering school. This to me is concerning, and it's not just a minor problem. We sometimes think, well, that just happens. That's not happening at you know, universities in the United States. That must be happening outside. I hear that a lot on commentary, at, uh, but this is happening. And one of the ways it's really been revealed is uh, the thing that scares me most. I would never want to wake up in the morning and find my name on Andrew Gelman's uh, <laughs> blog. Um, and this person found himself on Andrew Gelman's blog. Um, and I'll let you go through the details if you're interested. Long story short, an individual who owned the publisher, owned the, uh, uh, or the uh, that was in charge of basically, was basically the gatekeeper was publishing a whole bunch of these kinds of articles. I could show you many others. Many times the title had nothing to do with the text and they're about that long. But if you look at the boosts that you get in number of citations and prestige and potentially as it's written here, the salary that led to that hiring, that's problematic. But I do want to say, first, first of all, we do need to let the process work its way out. This is not unique. I could go on and on of other examples of these kinds of things. And I would hope, of course, that never happens to any of us. But what this does is it affects the trust on science. Um, and it also speaks to something else. Maybe we have incentives in place and there are things about our institution in science that are driving this kind of behavior. It's not unique. And by the way, I do this game all the time. I go, you tell me, Mr. Scientist and Mrs. Scientist, are all people scientists? Is this a predatory journal for you that are trained in science? Look at the title then. A mixed method study of telepathic interspecies communication with therapeutic riding horses and the recovering wounded veteran department. <laughs> okay, you probably know because I'm setting this up the way I am in this one. I have to do a lot of them to really to, to test you. Um, and by the way, when I talk about predatory journals, I'm talking about journals that really don't do any real peer review and are taking advantage of the open access by, by taking author fees. And that's a growing market. There are, there's been some analysis that needs to be updated but it's taking tens of billions of dollars from the academic system. But by the way, would you, would you share or beware of this? I think you know that I'm setting it up. You can, at least if you were sharing only on its inclusion into things like the Web of Science and Clarivate's journal reports, which really doesn't put it in the predatory market kind of classification by most researchers who look at it, you could share this. This is kind of crazy <clears throat> I mean, to think that that sort of thing would arise. It's not, this, in other words, this is not a predatory journal. No, it's not, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say a great journal, uh, but, uh, uh, and maybe that's a paper I need to read in more detail to understand what's got, uh, where we're getting from, but that's, but that's uh, for you to decide. Okay, so there is these issues of misinformation in science and about science. Let me give a, a couple examples about science that I care very much about. So I've been spending more and more time uh, working with health professionals that spend more and more of their clinical time talking about what the patient saw on Facebook. And actually, before the pandemic, the Surgeon General's office had reached out to me about some of the research that we were doing in this space. They were putting together this report. And since then, it's really ignited um, my uh, uh, passion to really work specifically on this issue. And one of the stories that sticks with me, and I told this to another group, um, was uh, working with the Emergency uh, 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 emergency Physicians Association and hearing all their stories that they've been dealing with. And one story in particular that really sat with me 
was a story about a patient that came in during COVID. And at that time, the protocol was to take a nose swab to see if you had COVID. If it was required, you couldn't come into the hospital without it. And the patient had an arm literally falling from the elbow, drip, the bandages were dripping in blood. He had had an, a construction accident, but he said he would not take a nose swab because there's ethylene oxide on these nose, according to what he'd been reading on the internet. Now, ethylene oxide is the sterilizing agent, and I can say right now it does not cause cancer or cause any death. But this person believed it so strongly, they turned away and walked out of the clinic, and that's the last those doctors ever saw. Now, I heard story, I've heard story after story after story. In fact, I would like to compile some of these stories that I'm hearing just as a way of driving home the point that misinformation is not just a common occurrence for many, it can affect behavior. And it's there that we can actually measure it. And it's really hard to measure exposure and behavioral change online. But it became such a problem in the state of Washington where I'm at that they had to come up with a flyer. Now there's a million different things that they could have created flyers on. They would have never guessed, at least talking to these health professionals, that they would have had to make a flyer on ethylene oxide. But they had to say basically, it doesn't have long-term effects and it is safe. Um, and that gets me to one of the more important points in our field that's been talked about by all sorts of people, including Data Boy, Michael Gobolecki, uh, it's, uh, Francesca Tripodi, all, uh, all lots of scholars that have looked at this issue of data voids. These are areas on the, these, there's information on the internet that just, we don't have the resources or the time to go and play whack-a-mole on every single uh, conspiracy theory or rumor that arises. And that becomes challenging. A long time ago, I did this game uh, in my uh, group where we tried to find a question on Google that you couldn't find an answer to. But we, we still play this game every once in a while, but it's hard to do um, because these, these voids are filled by all sorts of crazy ideas. And so with all the talk about vaccinations, one of the questions I wanted to ask was, do vaccinations cause shaken baby syndrome? That's gotta be one thing that no one has ever spoken of. But as you'd expect, there are websites that sort of support that sort of thing. Dangerous vaccines found to cause symptoms of shaken baby syndrome. And so this is the challenge that we had ahead of us when we're talking about issues related to misinformation about science. So what I wanna do now for the, the, the next part of the talk is walk through some myths about misinformation itself. I've had the opportunity to work in this space for many years now and thinking a lot about it. Um, and I can't identify, I can't, push out all the myths. I'd love to, to do that. That'll come in a different form at some point. But I just wanted to highlight four of them and use them, use them as an opportunity to talk about some of the things that we're doing in my research group, but also things that I'm seeing in the field that I think are interesting and relevant to this issue about misinformation itself. Now, for some, this might not be a myth. Anyone in research and science knows that science is not epistemically pure, but that's how I used to think about it as a kid, reading books about science and getting excited about doing science. I imagined that science was done kind of in this basement where you had just your curiosity to pull you along deep into the night to figure out how the world works. But I know that's not reality because me myself have accepted things like TED Talks, and I can, I can tell you that that is evidence of being solid. So I have to make fun of myself here for accepting those sorts of things. Science is ep epistemically solid, and we see it all over all the time if you work in science. But the problem is the public doesn't work in science. And as it became uh, open to the public during the pandemic, truly open for the first time, watching in real time, I don't think we've done a good enough job teaching the public that science is a social process. So let me give you just some of my fun examples. I use this example actually as an example of what bullshit is, uh, if you use the term, Marty. Um, but here's an example of 489. I mean, really, it's 4,840, whatever it is. There's tons of examples of these. So Sigmund Freud, in his writings, wrote about this is directly from his own writings. So I gave my lecture yesterday, despite a lack of preparation. I spoke quite well and without hesitation, which I ascribe to the cocaine I take in the course. <laughs> I told about my discoveries in brain anatomy, all very difficult things that the audience certainly didn't understand, but all that matters is that they get the impression that I understand. <laughs> Humans run science, not bees, not creatures that don't have incentives. This is the things that, you know, we have to, excuse me, contend with in science. 
One of the things I've been talking about for a long time, just because I've learned this from economists, is that giving bad answers is not the worst thing a ranking system can do. The worst thing is to encourage bad science. And boy, have we seen the effects in science. One of the more telling ways in which uh, incentives can be set up in the wrong ways is the bonuses that have been provided for authors across, across the world. Now, the largest one was China here at $165,000, and they received so much criticism that they actually revoked that during the pandemic. Thank goodness. What you get here is a hundred, well, at least before they took it away, not other, all countries have taken, they, they haven't taken all, all incentives away, but you would get a $165,000 bonus by getting a publication in Nature of Science. So what happens to people's behavior? It's not anything close to epistemically pure anymore. There's the gaming, there's over flooding these uh, journal uh, journals and the peer review system. It's unfortunately sometimes fraud. It's, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the kind of thing that we need to be careful of and avoid. And there's been some corrections on this, but this is just one example. I wanna give you the worst use case. I've only shown this a couple of times in a couple of conferences. I don't want to overuse it, but again, I also don't want to, I certainly don't provide a name here because I don't, and this is a real thing from a colleague of mine that works at another public university that had this sent to her. This is the worst use of uh, H-index, but is a demonstration, at least in my book, of how science is far from epistemically pure, and we have to take that into consideration as we study this information. So, so here is an actual email that was sent to my colleague. You don't know me, but I'm a fellow academic. So notice you have a pretty good research prestige, as indicated by the H index of 15. Even one paper of yours has been cited 170 times, exclamation point. This is great considering you're pretty new at academia. My prestige is not bad either, but I'm in a bit longer link. Uh, what provide a link? I know how hard it is for academics who are single to find a mate. I've been single for a long time. If there is an off chance that you're single, please pick me. I like your work. It is very interesting, and I think you are quite attractive. I would like to go out on a date with you. What do you say? Let's start a wonderful romance. This was a real thing. And by the way, this has been taken advantage in the anti-vaccination community. I don't know if you know this, but one of the more successful dating sites that emerged during the pandemic was an anti-vaccination. If you were not vaccinated, you could come and you'd find your mate in that place. That's a little bit uh, of a side note. But the problem is here is that people will respond to these kinds of incentives. And actually economists have been talking about this for decades. Goodhart's Law is you know, an important thing that uh, I keep seeing almost every single day that any observed statistical regular will tend to collapse once pressure is on it. Um, I think Marilyn Stratham said it better, better when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And I'm also related to that is Campbell's law, that the more any quantitative social indicators used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social pressure it intended to monitor. And even better than that is my colleague, Carl Bergstrom, who says, when a measure becomes a target, people do stupid. And that's essentially what's happening even in science. All right, so myth number one, let's cross it out. Science is epistemically pure. It is absolutely not, it's far from it, but that's okay. If you've read the knowledge machine, or any of these great new uh, philosophy, well, there's some old ones too, philosophy, but we talk about you can have irrational systems and irrational agents running the system, and it still can work remarkably well. And to me, that's amazing. And that's worth studying. But let's move on to the next thing. Counter consensus communities are anti science. And what I mean by counter consensus communities, these are communities that are, say, not so sure about climate change, that uh, are you know, not so sure about vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of times, when they're written about in the public, people think that they're anti-science. And I actually believed that at one point. I just thought, oh, well, we just need to teach them the science. We need to teach them. It wasn't necessarily just an information deficit issue, but we just needed to teach them a little bit more on what science was good uh, because, or that what science was, and maybe they'll appreciate science. They appreciate science. That's a take on And I'm going to show you two studies that have done it. Now, one of, a lot of this was motivated early on. I wrote about some of these things during the pandemic. I wrote this op-ed in, in uh, on for NBC News about this strange issue around hydroxychloroquine. Of course, everyone has heard of this. But what's surprising to me as someone who studies this issue, this interface between society and science, is I would have never, ever, ever guessed before the pandemic that people would aggregate around medically verifiable issues like treatment for a major infectious disease. To me, that's mind-boggling still. 
but it really speaks to all the interesting things we can study when thinking about this particular issue. In fact, what the most interesting stat, I'll give you the stat, I find this is one time I needed my notes here, is that there was a survey by the Rasmussen Report that looked at a thousand, that asked a thousand American adults, um, this was early uh, in April 2001, would you take uh, hydroxychloroquine? And a huge number of individuals, this was 53% of Republicans were willing to take this anti-malarial drug, while 19% are Democrats. To see that kind of difference based on something you can look up and engage the literature with is still mind boggling to me. Now, in the state of Washington, there are sports heroes like there are sports heroes in many different states. And one of them is this NBA legend. His name's John Stockton. He actually went to Gonzaga and Gonzaga basketball is very big in our, our state of Washington. He's also you know, one of the all time steel leaders, you know, assists, all sorts of things in the NBA, big name. And by the way, I didn't say idiot of the year. Um, that's dead spin here, so I want to be careful uh, uh, of that. But he and many others like him did their own research during the pandemic. I kept hearing that. I did my research. I looked. Um, and his conclusion, and he even made such, I can say this, uh, unsubstantiated claims that 150 athletes where they had just dropped dead, just dropped dead, which of course wasn't true by any uh, by any means, but this received a bunch of attention. He actually was banned from the school he went to. This is an NBA legend, couldn't even go to the college basketball games anymore. This led to uh, all sorts of interesting stories. And that provoked me to start thinking about the ways in which they do their own research. How do they engage with literature? Because I'm not against people doing research. We want to engage the public in that. Citizen science is one of the great stories of science over the last 10, 15 years. I love that. People should engage with the literature, but how are they engaging and do they care about science in the same, or do they under, uh, uh, do they engage in science in the same way? And of course, um, that's what this research was about. And so one thing you'll notice when you look at where they're referencing um, and where a lot of these groups are collating, you're going to see very often doctor, 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 doctor. Now, some of the doctors actually aren't doctors. They're doctorates of English, um, talking about health, but that's a different story um, by itself. And a lot of them are in lab coats. You see them in lab coats. They really do look to experts still. They do, it's not that they are completely anti-expert, even though there has been this rise of individualism on the internet over the last 10 years. Um, and there has been a pushback to the elite establishment. Um, certainly that's been happening, but they still, at least that's the research we've shown, and we wanted to ask that question around perceived expertise. And when I talk about expertise here, I'm talking about not just actually having an MD, but maybe putting an MD on your biography on social media and what that impact can have on your ability to govern conversations within that community. So we're asking this question, what is the prevalence and relative influence of perceived experts who spread COVID-19 vaccine misinformation. This is a paper that just came out uh, last week uh, with my student uh, uh, that I've been co-advising, Mallory Harris from Stanford, who's graduating, and Aaron uh, Mordecai at Stanford, and then two students, Ryan and uh, Shupan at, uh, at the University of Washington. Essentially, what we did is we gathered, uh, we, we collect a whole bunch of data, at least when we were collecting data on Twitter. We don't really do that anymore um, uh, for various reasons. Um, but we have... Uh, at that time, we did have data on about 4 million tweets and about 5 million users that included vaccine discussion in April 2020. These data sets are massive, and we had to do a lot of hand inspections, so we really isolated it to one month. The reason why we isolated to that month was that was when there was uh, policy being employed about vaccine availability and policies surrounding uh, the requirements of vaccines. Um, and then we looked, uh, we basically built a, what's called a co-engagement network, where edges link accounts that were retreated twice by at least 10 of the same users. Um, and we did some clustering and we did a bunch of manual labor. So I can go into more details, but the main take home is that we did see two almost equal, uh, equal size um, groups. We looked at these different accounts. We looked uh, at how many were perceived experts. We found about 13% perceived experts. These are individuals that list PhDs, MDs, and various other credentials. We found 3,000 pro-vaccine and 27 anti-vaccine. Um, and we actually found several that changed their profile, which is not surprising. They didn't have expertise and all of a sudden they had expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was fun to watch. Uh, and also even transferring expertise from 
You were an economist at one point, all of a sudden you became an epidemiologist. That was, that, those were interesting ones too. Uh, we did not, um, we anonymized the names so that we weren't influenced too much by those. And I'll just show you a couple of the take homes because I have a lot of more things I want to cover as well, but we can go back to this if you want. So one of the big things that users in the anti-vaccination community shared low quality sources, um, more so, uh, and perceived experts shared um, uh, academic research. So that actually both sort of shared this sort of thing, but the proportion of low quality links, it's a no, not a huge surprise, obviously, but there was still, we need to look at this. And the big thing is that we found no significant difference in influence boost for perceived experts between the two communities. Um, that was one of the, the big surprising things. Actually, going into this, I really did believe that that was going to be the case. And um, and we sort of, when we pre-registered this uh, paper, we asked that sort of question. And I, you know, I, and we all sometimes, uh, you know, might lean uh, to one answer that we think might come. And, and that was a little bit surprising. And the anti-vaccination community contains an alternative to set of perceived experts. Uh, they're a huge, sizable presence. Um, in fact, they, uh, you know, and, and both showed low... Uh, low quality uh, and academic sources. So really the whole point is it was very difficult to tell the difference. If you closed your eyes, you jumped in one community, you jumped in the other, there are certain metrics we couldn't tell. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, on that first slide, can you just clarify what was the treatment in that slide? So the treatment here is we were looking at, so there's various different kinds of um, ways in which we treated the different, different groups. We basically used propensity score matching. Um, on those different uh, metrics. And then basically by doing that, we could see exactly how the, we're doing the trip, uh, how we were uh, seeing how they were separated by those different metrics. But so, sorry, yeah. did, did the treatment, the expression of these expert signifiers or? Yes, exactly. Whether it has, so if they, so sorry, I, now I know what your question is like, what, what, yes, it's like if they had that, and even if there was individuals that actually changed, we pulled them out. But those that said I am a I am an individual with expertise with a PhD or have a you know some sort of um, expertise in this area versus ones that just they don't put anything. Actually, a lot of the if you look at a lot of the biographies, most people as you know I guess it's not too much of a surprise you don't have the um, that description. In fact, um, that's one thing we want to go back and check is like for those that even listed any description, are there things that we were missing in the text because there were so many? That because we were just just using the PhD MD and a set of other features. So yeah, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, just a further clarification. Yeah. So is this within groups? So or or are you looking at people that were hearing from both? Sides? It's within groups. So it's within the, it, different groups. And actually, if you study this sort of thing, they tend to actually. It's not like there's a lot of work that's been done on echo chambers, but there really are. They're not listening. There are some bridges. In fact, we. That's another follow up. So there were individuals that were being heard by both groups. We had to put it to the side. Actually, we um, we were, we might even have a small draft of it, but we basically put those to the side because those are those are the individuals that I find So, so the point that you're trying to make here is that the, the role of experts was no different in the two groups or the way expertise was expressed? Was the the second one, it's okay. the latter. It's basically that the, there was no difference between those communities in the way that experts were actually governing, the way I think about it is governing conversation. So that's, it's basically the latter of what you just said. And so, um, so we look, we, we basically look at these different ways in which we're changing uh, uh, the, the, between these two different groups and the way they're exchanging and sharing different uh, content. And then, um, and really the, the big, big take home there is that perceived experts are important figures um, in the anti-vaccination community. Um, and those uh, individuals played as almost an important role, and it's you know still still more work that needs to be done to figure out exactly what that role is. But that particular um, uh, you know sort of finding has really kind of changed my paradigm of how I think about these different communities. Um, so now I want to move from like perceived expertise to perceived consensus, um, and this is something that I have found looking at through this working. Um, with my students and collaborators looking at a lot of these examples is that it's not um, about <clears throat> necessarily um, whether there's one piece of information that's going to change someone's opinion. Um, when people are making arguments for one side or the other, they use consensus. Um, and consensus, even if you're in what we call counter the counter consensus group, that individual um, or will still say, here's the consensus, and they'll actually use a lot of these different modes, whether they're in, uh, you know, on social media, using data sources, using um, self-published science. They will point to these 
um, different places and do their best to basically create a sense of consensus. So it's not necessarily that there is consensus. And I want to be clear here. It's not necessarily that there is consensus, but they um, are basically using their argumentation and their evidence as a way to create this perception of consensus. And so that's kind of what we're after. And looking at some examples, if I gave you these six different blocks and I said, I mean, I need to give you more time to actually look through these individual things, you would, uh, you would be able to, uh, it would be very hard. It was certainly hard for me um, and the students as we look through these kinds of things to look and decide which of these is a legitimate science source and which is not. I'll just tell you at this point that the top is actually a legitimate science. You, have the, you see the CDC up there. You see uh, this patient care, which is a well-known um, uh, medical site talking about the efficacy of masks in this case. Now, these on the bottom are different. They're, uh, they're from, like this individual is a well-known individual uh, that I, I think worked for RT, uh, which is a Russian, uh, essentially, uh, propaganda news uh, station. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of these individuals uh, jump from one kind of conspiracy theory to another, but they, they have a lot of attention and they have the audience for doing that um, sort of uh, sort of thing. And, and the point here is that we really couldn't tell uh, much of a difference at all. And what's interesting is when we looked at both groups, this particular paper, so this a cluster randomized trial of cloth masks compared with medical masks and healthcare workers was the most cited thing in both groups. That's bizarre to me. Like this particular paper was cited by both groups as evidence that masks work or masks don't work. How could that be, right? Well, by the way, also this, when Tucker Carlson had a show, this paper was mentioned multiple times. Um, and the reason why this paper is mentioned in the negative is that it shows that masks, at least in this case, weren't effective but this was in a very small, uh, a very small study, and it was on cloth masks, and it was in outpatient care. And if you look at the paper that the main individual that has, you know, I think the main expert in the world around masks, they've had to make a note. Again, here's another one of those blue boxes. I had to use two of them here from the New England Journal of Medicine. The article was published in a letter to the editor. The authors of this article stated, "We strongly support the case of public health agencies." for all people to wear masks when circumstances compel them to be within six feet. This was a paper that was being cited so often in the communities saying that masks weren't effective online that the New England Journal of Medicine felt compelled to actually put this particular message. And so this particular um, um, kind of issue that we see was one of the more bizarre things that you're basically seeing. And, and the reason why they, that many of the other groups cited them in the affirmative is because this author has tons and tons of papers. And even in that paper itself, there, uh, you could use this as evidence. And one of the sort of general findings that we found is that if you look at all the papers cited in the data set that we looked at, this was um, a recent published paper in Science Advances. If you looked at those particular papers um, in Science Advances, they would break, or sorry, in this paper in Science Advances, if you looked at all the papers that were cited in the literature, they break up by mode and method, as you'd expect the literature to break up. So that is not surprising at all. These are all the papers that were cited within the scientific literature. If you look at those same papers that were referenced on social media, and in this case, Twitter, they this is the same, same papers. They break up very differently and they break up, of course, by standards. But yet they're using the same literature. How can that possibly be? And so what we find in this work is that you can take the same literature and you can construct this perception of consensus through all these different modes, not just through citations and the evidence um, argumentation that we use in science, but from all these other modes that you find on social media. So you can then take the same literature and somehow, and it's pretty effective. And I would say, let's not underestimate uh, these groups that, uh, that you think might not know much about science. They actually know quite a bit about science and the norms of science. And so that's uh, you know, one of the big lessons that I've learned about um, sort of this idea that you know, you know, anti-vaccination, anti-mask, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, aren't necessarily anti-science. So that's one of the um, big things that we are, you know, that keeps ringing in my head as well. So science communities cite much of the same literature as scientists, however, consensus diverge via misleading contextualization and things like negative citations are things that we don't do as much in science, surprisingly, maybe we should do more. 
um, but we see it very often um, in communities that talk about science online. So that's the big take home there is that there's, uh, there's um, you know, this, you know, don't, don't jump too fast to anti-science like I have done before. Now, one of the things that I should full disclosure, I'm on the board of this startup. This idea here is to provide a tool for the public to engage with the literature. So I've talked a lot about how we want, I mean, I want the public engaging in the literature. And by the way, there's lots of others like it. So it's not like this is the first, there's many others that are doing the same kinds of things where there's simple claim extraction so that people can ask questions about the efficacy and how many studies that maybe show in the affirmative, how many show in the negative. Um, and it's using some of the summarization techniques that are now available through these large language models. Even though I'm mostly quite critical of, of these kinds of things um, within science, I think synthesis you know, is one thing. But again, you should take that with a grain of salt since I'm uh, helping provide advice for this group. But the idea here is to provide um, the literature to the public in ways that they can engage um, that go beyond um, just looking up individual studies, that they can actually look at the meta summary. So if you see a study that shows the effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine, that you would see that that's 10 of maybe 300 that say that it's not necessarily effective or there's no evidence of its efficacy. So that's the kind of thing that we're after. Okay, so let's go through the, the next uh, myths. So the next myth um, I wanna talk about is this reproducibility crisis is evidence that science is broken. That's definitely absolutely not the case, but let's first talk about the reproducibility crisis. So that's, it's been an issue, as many of you know, for a long time, that many of the results, key results in major fields are not necessarily reproducing when people go about doing that in good faith. So what's going on? Um, if you look at one of the more famous studies that really provoked the, the movement in this field and the concern, it was a paper that was basically looking at some of the top cited uh, psychology papers um, of you know, of all time, I, I don't know if it's all time, but some of the key papers at that time, and, and uh, I always do a sort of guess how many reproduced um, before I show. Anyone want to guess how many? Some of you maybe know the result. Turns out that 39 out of 100 were able to replicate. Now, that number for some might be a good number. Actually, 39, knowing all the ways in which sci how science works, <laughs> that's darn good. But of course, most of the time, people look at it and go, Dang! If you're the, from the public, you go. These are these aren't just any random studies. This is this is some of the key studies you find in textbooks. You couldn't replicate more than that. Doesn't give you a lot of confidence. Now this is happening across all fields. Economists have worried about this too, and they've done the replication. They've reported on these findings. They've looked at you know relative effect size, original you know survey beliefs, all this. But they don't just list their own results. They had to compare themselves to the psychologists. Which I always find <laughs> for economists. So this is kind of a typical economist doing their thing. But that's, we'll leave it at that. Now it's been done in cancer and all sorts of other areas as well. Now a lot of people run immediately to this issue of fraud, and there's certainly fraud in science. But in my readings and, and discussions with many people on this topic over many years now, I think fraud's a tiny aspect. And I actually put the brimstone butterfly because it is an example of fraud. It's one of my favorite examples of fraud where Carl Linnaeus in the 1700s, who you know came up with the you know the, the classification system that we even still use today, was fooled by this. Uh, William Cartlands basically took an ink pen at the time and colored a what looked like a new butterfly. It was, and then called it a brimstone, and he listed it. Um, that's fraud. Now, fraud is not so common though, and I think what's much more of an issue, like many that study this area, are questionable research practices. In fact, I'm doing a project for the NIH where we're building. Uh, teaching modules for the new biomedical researchers on things like outcome switching and making sure that people are aware of one, how difficult it is to detect outcome switching and what the consequences are of outcome switching for the field and what the consequences of your own results, what the consequences are for your results if you don't pay attention to all these different kinds of things from p-hacking, outcome switching, parking, uncorrected multiple comparisons, et cetera. And really at the core of this really is Aside from uh, you know some fraud, it's really publication bias, and that occurs when authors preferentially report and journals preferentially publish positive results. So this is called the file drawer effect because we publish things that have the uh, papers that got us over that line, that p-value line, and that the negative results then go in the file drawer. But the question that, of course, a lot of us who've been thinking about this for a, a while, what we really care about is how many negative results go unpublished 
Uh, there's not been a lot of work on this because it's very hard to do. In fact, I'd love to figure out a way if we could incorporate some of this new technology to try to better estimate this. I have talked to people with some colleagues in Australia that are working on this and in other places. This is very hard to do. This is like the one study, this is 2012, and they, the study was so small because it's hard to do. But even if we could do this, this is really not what we're after. What we want to know is the fraction of negative results that are unpublished. And one of my favorite studies of all time in this field, and I think is one of the most influential for revealing what the issues are, was a paper by this guy named Eric Turner. And he actually worked at the federal agency at that time that required, this is the FDA, that required you essentially at that time to pre-register. That's essentially what's happening in other fields. Now we're pre-registering and you know that's one solution to this issue, but it's not a panacea. But essentially what he had done, he was at the FDA so he could see in the literature what was positive results and what were negative results. So what you would see, this is the view you would see if you only looked at the literature. Every box represents a paper on these antidepressant drugs. And I just want to say right away that I'm, that I'm not making any claims about antidepressant drugs working or not. I think they're obvious. That's not my area of expertise. But I do want to say that this is what you would see in the literature. All the white boxes look like positive. So if you look at these different drugs, you might get a certain view of how effective they are. But if you move forward, or sorry, if you get to see, if you move to the view that Eric saw and his colleagues, this is what he saw. The black boxes indicate negative results. Now, again, it doesn't mean that some of these drugs aren't effective. It just means that you have to interpret these findings much differently when you have that meta view. And even more interesting is when you actually look at the ones that have been outcome switched and those that essentially had some of these other questionable research practice issues. You see here like six and seven were positive, but they actually got dropped down actually after you account for the outcome switching um, and other issues that were uh, involved with some of these studies. So the point here is that we need to do something about it. And one of the things that we have been doing are these registered reports. I do want to say it's not a panacea. This is this, it is a good idea and we should be doing it as much as we can, but there are lots of uh, different kinds of research uh, areas that we don't necessarily, it's not actually good. I actually, in many ways, exploratory research, for example, can be really stunted if you have to pre-register everything. And there, yeah, anyway, I, I could go into that a little bit more. But the point is, it's a good idea. We should do uh, essentially create these designs, get those evaluated, and then you can get acceptance of publication at the design of the experiment, but, but it's not always perfect. Um, and so you get this idea where results are known after you, um, or it's not the results that govern this sort of thing. My colleagues and I um, have also been looking at the ways in which varying effects can maybe be changing the way we look at reproducibility crisis. It still doesn't um, it still doesn't mean that we don't have an issue. We need to deal with this. But the point here is that reproducible crisis is not evidence that science is broken. All right, so the last thing I'm going to go through, and then I'm going to talk about a few solutions, uh, just because uh, you know I've been talking about a lot of the problems, um, is that science journalism is to blame for communication gone wry. And in some cases, that is the true, that is true. But I have found in my work and working with researchers in journalism, that a lot of the blame can actually start at university press offices. <laughs> and scientists are culpable and complicit in this as much as anyone because they have incentives. And I think that's a problem. And also, as the modes of communication change, like the ad, you know, the adoption, the new official adoption of the bioarchive during the pandemic, um, that was a good thing. I'm a huge fan of the preprint, but journalists, even scientists themselves, weren't quite ready for that, or at least uh, if you weren't in computer science and already putting things in the archive or an astronomer putting things in the archive, this article right here is one of the most shared articles of all time, uh, if you look at the altmetric score. And it continues to be shared. In fact, I have a student, Jahan, who's been looking at this um, and watches, it's just been constantly keeping track of the ways in which this continues to be shared. This article has been withdrawn. It has a little red box instead of a blue box like the New England Journal of Medicine one I was showing you, but look how tiny that is and small that is. This actually took off partly because it was this uh, story around the origins, which is still being worked out. We don't know, but this had some methodological problems. And the authors didn't even, like the authors even conceded this sort of thing. They weren't even, like, this wasn't even uh, something that uh, they were fully uh, 
pushing back on them. And there, obviously there's more to it than that. But the point is, this is this is still um, being shared. And if you look at the 50 most shared research studies, and it, like at least according to this plus research article, of the 50 most shared research studies about health outcomes, a half of the news articles misattributed causality based on correlative evidence, but even worse than that, and I told my students it, a third of the journal articles was misattributed by the researchers themselves. So yes, journalists are partly at fault, but it's also the scientists. And when you study misinformation, you have this infrastructure to study what goes viral, you get to get these great stories that emerge in your database. Um, and here's one. This was one of the more um, viral spreading uh, uh, news stories during the pandemic, or the whole bunch of them. But this was one of them that really caught a lot of people's eye in lots of different countries and lots of different languages that bald men were at higher risk of severe coronavirus symptoms. This is reported by Forbes and many others, and it was published in a legitimate journal. It was not a predatory journal, it's a good journal, Federal American Academy of Dermatology. It had um, this, uh, you know, you know more sophisticated idea of how the androgen pathway was involved, et cetera. And the question they were essentially asking, the hypothesis was that there was this endocrine involvement in COVID pathogenesis where baldness um, was essentially causing COVID. Risk. But they forgot something very important. I, I got a couple, a couple of students already know the answer, but what, what did they forget here? Yes, of course, yes. So they had to retract this as did many other venues because they didn't control for age. But this happened not necessarily at the, they did happen at the journalist space, but it was happening in the peer review system. It was happening among the editors. This is like, wait a minute, these are good journals. So of course, a lot of people say, well, it's easy to poke at some of the problems. There's lots of good papers that are still published. And that's true, but we can still do a better job. Now, there's even some papers, this landed in many like NPR stories around the country. I, I mean, NPR, because I've heard it first on NPR. This was the study that everyone was talking about during COVID. You couldn't go for a run because of like the, the particles were coming out based on the study from Belgium. Well, I looked into it. Not only could I not find a preprint, there was this was just a simulation. It was just a simulation someone threw on the web. That was it. There was no peer review. There wasn't even a preprint. Yet this went viral like crazy during the pandemic. So these are the challenges we have. And as I always say, correlations don't sell newspapers. Causation sell newspapers. <laughs> And so if you can tell a positive story, you'll sell newspapers. So it starts out like this, maybe, moderate consumption of wine is correlated with reduced heart rate disease. The news report, based on, and I have many examples to support if you want to see many examples that come directly from our uh, university press offices that jump to this issue of red wine consumption reduces heart disease, but even better than that, they then jump to drink a glass, aggressive, uh, glass of red wine with dinner to stave off heart disease. So this is kind of where it goes, and this is how it sells. So these are the these are myths among many different myths um, that I wanted to sort of go through today. But now I just want to, for five more minutes or four more minutes here, I want to talk about what we can do about it. So there's this issue of misinformation about science that I talked about. What can we do about it? So I'm going to go relatively fast here. So we have time for open discussion. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and what you see as some of the issues in science, as many of you are researchers in this space. So first of all, there's all sorts of things we can do. My colleague and I published in Nature Medicine recently about some of the ways in which we can sort of go forth, especially with this rise of AI in science, you know, you know avoid reputation laundering. We need to do a better job of, of doing citation uh, auditing. Of course, we need better um, efforts at uh, understanding the incentives, augmented peer review. There's a whole bunch of things that we can do in the publishing industry. But in general, one of the things I've seen studying this area for a long time, the science of science area, is that peer review has reached a burnout state that I've never seen. And many of you that review papers for journals and conferences, I don't know if you felt it, I felt it, and I'm trying to gather data on it, I have never seen it so bad. And it's only gonna get worse as AI makes it easier to write papers. So we have to figure out what to do there. Now, I already mentioned, you know, promoting registered reports. That's one way. There's a whole bunch of things we can do around predatory publishing. In fact, the latest scam is basically taking actual content from legitimate journals and placing them in these content, like, just as a way of driving traffic. Now, the thing that my colleagues in the body have done to address some of these challenges, not just in science, but in society, has been, <laughs> excuse me, uh, establishing this uh, Center for an Informed Public, where we used to just be a few faculty. Now we have a pretty uh, large number of faculty and postdocs and research scientists. And most of what we do is computational social science like. Um, and even, you know, I make fun of ducks seeing in visualization. I call them ducks, but at, we actually have found ducks in our uh, social networks. So of course, this is not a real duck. And we can even, uh, if one paper where we look at the removal of accounts 
as biologists have done looking at the removal of keystone species, then we can I can add an eye to the definite. It makes it even more fun. Um, so, but the point here is that we need to be thinking about uh, doing all sorts of um, uh, work trying to understand interventions. So we've published some papers on interventions and we have lots of research, but really ultimately what we're trying to do in the center is transfer the research findings into policy and education. And a lot of times, I, I, I paid lip service to it. I think we all paid lip service to it to some degree. We put it in our broader statements in NSF, but it's something we're legitimately trying to do. Um, and so, you know, I, many of you know, I, I teach this class on calling bullshit and I have a book on it, but we really want to start figuring out ways to evaluate. So we have a program where we bring thousands of high school students from all over Washington at different campuses that we run to spend an entire day talking about media literacy. We have games. I have a game uh, that my colleague and I, we started, this was in 2018 or 19. It's been played tens of millions of times to bring public awareness to these kinds of things. We even have an escape room that's been transferred into lots of different <laughs> languages. We can do it virtually and we can do it in person. We also have a lot of these techniques that we've had a lot of research done specifically on techniques that we've learned from our research. And some of them have even led to changes on, I mentioned this in my seminar on Friday, to changes on Google. So Mike Caulfield, who's the one been pushing this with Google for many years, finally got Google to put these three little dots on here. So these three little dots came from uh, partly, not all of us, but part of this work we need to provide metadata um, as fact checkers would use to find us. You can even now, they announced just recently that now they have these three little dots, they like them so much, in images. So if you find that shark swimming in the street for the next hurricane, you will know that it's been debunked many, many times and it's been around at least 10 years. That sort of thing can be found in this metadata. We also have been doing a bunch of community and uh, 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 participatory learning and, and co-design with um, communities, community college, uh, community organizations, community colleges, oops, sorry, um, rural libraries and uh, schools. And then I just wanna mention something about policy that I truly for the first time engaged in policy like I haven't before. So we, I um, was a part with Ryan Kalo, we helped write uh, one of these, fir the, the first bill in the state of Washington at least that requires disclosure of deep fakes during an election and those kind of bills are building across the country. Actually, I've been working with um, senators uh, at the federal level on some new things. Some of you saw the Defiance Act that's coming on around non-consensual um, images uh, and, and likeness um, issues uh, following the Taylor Swift uh, story several weeks ago. Um, some of those are now sort of moving into all different states, both red and blue. There's also some changes going on that I think are quite controversial within the medical community. I'm not, I don't advocate it. I'm not one way or the other. I, I think it's a little, some people can make a good argument for it. Some can make a good argument against it, but some uh, organizations are now saying that there are gonna be severe consequences to spreading um, lies about uh, consensus findings within science. I think this is gonna be very challenging. We have to be careful here, but it is happening. We also have a, a unit at the National Science Foundation that allows us to ask questions. Could we have predicted reproducibility crisis? How do we study the science of science? We've been supported on several grants to look at the ways in which different metrics are used. In, and in the social sciences, as an example, we've been looking at the ways in which inequality measures um, are um, actually misused in so many papers. I don't know how many, but what I, I think it's a whole bunch. And we did that by looking at the simple question of how you know, search and evaluation um, are integrated in a way in academic search that could be sort of nudging us in ways. You know, what, you know, looking at the impact of search engines and recommender systems on science, is it narrowing our view of the literature or are we expanding that view? <laughs> Excuse me, these are questions that I'm looking at as well. And then the last thing, of course, no one can do a talk nowadays without mentioning generative AI. So let me give you an example, another hot off the press. Uh, maybe some of you saw it if you follow this area uh, over the last uh, couple of days. Um, but we're starting to see this in the literature in very offensive ways. Um, and here's one example. So this particular um, paper was uh, looking at, it was looking at, uh, well, I'll show you the retraction so you can see that because I don't know the paper well enough. Cellular functions of uh, spermogenial stem cells uh, in relation to this. Um, someone had used, obviously, mid-journey, I think, a mid-journey life tool to create a figure um, of the rat, and of course, anatomically, it's not um, even close to accurate. If you look at the like the the labels here, um, and this is this is in Frontiers. Frontiers is somewhat controversial sometimes, um, but this sort of thing is going to likely be happening. Now they retracted it 
even though the author, the peer reviewers had called, at least one peer reviewer had called this particular thing out and, and the different journals have different kinds of rules associated with this. Um, but we're going to be dealing with this as we go on. And generative AI in science is really that, you know, of course, we already live within this tsunami of papers. How is that going to affect and, you know, how are we going to, what are we going to do with authors? And by the way, I should give you an old version of this way back in, oops, sorry, 2016. And I think of that as way back. We were already using auto, we, there was an individual that used autocomplete to get their paper accepted at the International Conference on a topic in nuclear physics. They essentially use the autocomplete. You don't have to read the abstract. They used autocomplete with their Apple phone and got it accepted. So this autocomplete on steroids with LLMs is a, you know, that was happening a way long time ago. And of course, if I ask at my own, like my own papers, who wrote these papers? These are just hallucinations of myself, uh, of myself. And, and I talked about this on the seminar on Friday, is that we have to be careful of these, uh, of these question and answer systems essentially looking as if they're science-like because the citations at this point are done post hoc. And that's really important. We should also not ignore the bespoke models that are better than I think a lot of these generalized models. And a lot of my colleagues have been looking at the effects of areas that get ignored, like Alexa sort of spewing different kinds of science misinformation, especially around vaccines and around elections that we can't ignore. And then of course, Google, the sort of door to the internet um, provides all sorts of inaccurate, well, uh, like even just recent uh, inaccurate information when it comes to even just the basic facts. Some of you may have seen this. I talked about this for uh, a while ago. Um, it actually got written up as an Atlantic or not due to me. There was others that were also writing about it. But if you look at this and it still exists because I tested it on Friday in our seminar, is there a country in Africa that starts with K? While there are 54 recognized countries in Africa, none of them together with K. The closest is Kenya, which starts with a K sound, but it's actually spelled with a K sound. It's always interesting to learn new trivia from it. So there's all sorts of problems. But when it comes to science issues, this is something my student just found recently. We just sent out a paper yesterday on, on some of these issues. Uh, it's essentially a blog post at this point, but it's a paper we put on, uh, we'll put on the archive where we look at all these different ways in which issues around science like abortion actually flips the answer. So this is showing like that you're at risk of, the, of these uh, complications. Um, and it looks like it's complications due to abortion. Well, if you look at the actual article and you go to the article in which this actually been pulled, like it's almost word for word, it was actually giving the opposite result. These are things you'd have if, you, if this woman didn't abort. And it makes up theories and talks about nicotine in ways that aren't true. There's a theory that says I have Jen's theory of social echoes. I don't have such a theory. There's no way. Uh, I, I talked about this, but it was interesting to hear its answer. And then I'll end with my just sort of summary of uh, at least its effect on science. When I, I talked about this a little bit, one of the most important laws in bullshit uh, studies is Brandelaney's law, which is this idea. It's pretty simple, easy to create bullshit, hard to clean it up. It's actually a real Wikipedia entry. And Galactica came along. This was so the science solution that LLMs were coming for. It was only up for like three or four days. This was Meta's version saying, look, we can create science papers that will sort of change the way science is done. So I asked it a simple question. What's Brandolini's law? Um, and this is the answer it gave. Brandolini's law is a theory in economics, not true, proposed by Brandolini, not, uh, the professor at University of Pottery, not true, not true, not true. It basically was bullshitting the bullshit principle. So that's kind of my view of kind of how these sort of could uh, affect science. Now, of course, there's some good things that these things can do for science. And I think a lot of us have talked about these, but I just wanted to say that. So last thing here is, so the question you'll be asking, so is most science just plain wrong? Um, I told you that despite these problems that I've mentioned and many others I didn't mention, um, science is still pretty effective. And the reason why I think it's effective is for these five reasons. Science and replication is cumulative. So I mentioned CRISPR technology at the beginning. If CRISPR technology didn't work, all these other things that are being built on it at some point would all fall like a house of cards. That's one thing. There are often multiple ways to deviate from null hypothesis and get an interesting result. And that's important because there, there's that kind of partly explains some of the issues that we're seeing with the reproducibility price. And contrary results become very interesting if you are going against reality. So if you find something that's that one major result that's different than anything else you've ever seen, it would get attention and might find itself in nature or science. And replication, by the way, is not the same as truth. And even more important than that is to heck with theory empirically with words. So looking forward, there's all sorts of things. I'm curious to hear what your issues are if you think about misinformation within your field. 
Uh, I want this is something, of course, that I'm passionate about, want to learn more, and love to talk more about. Um, but looking forward, I'll mention three things. That one, we have to figure out how to measure the issue because it's it's not an easy thing to measure. I think we need to teach science as a social science, and importantly. I think we really need, of course, data from tech, but we need independence, not just in the right of publication, but in the control of the questions. So in the flurry of papers that came out in Nature and Science over the last six months that were this you know, interesting, and I think it's good to some degree, this collaboration with Facebook, the problem there is that a lot of the questions were being controlled by the tech. And if you control the question, you control the, uh, you control the agenda. So I think we need to take that in consideration when we think about independence. Um, and then the last thing is, this is a picture from the Exploratorium. We should just allow our curiosity still to engage us and engage the public. Science still works remarkably well given these issues in science, and I'm optimistic that we can work through it. So I want to acknowledge a lot of the students and faculty that I've had lots of discussions about this and written papers with. And so happy to mention that. And sorry for going just over a few minutes. I'm happy to take questions and open the commentary. Thank you. All right, questions or comments? And I was realizing I did not, like I threw with that, it's so fast for that one that I was like, oh my gosh, like the easiest thing in truth. Oh, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. All right, Marty. Uh, thank you for the fabulous talk. There's a lot in there. We'll all want to deconstruct later. Uh, one of the issues you mentioned is the um, incentive structure, and I think that's been recently distorted by citation counts and so on, uh, but also uh, I guess that's under your category of looking at science as a social science. Perhaps. Yes. I can't help but turn the mirror on you. I know you called yourself, uh, you said yourself that, you know, you're not, it's not epistemically pure, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm noticing sure. that people are suddenly publishing in PNAS, Nature, yeah. and so on, that never used to, like topics that never yeah. used to go there. And, you know, you showed yeah. quite a few of those as well. Uh, and so uh, what do you think the solution is to, to this? Because people are incentivized to have the PR company say things and say that it's in these publications rather than in specialized areas where maybe the experts are more expert. I think ultimately the most important thing we can do is look to our genes. <laughs> yeah. uh, because ultimately they're the ones, and I'm not just saying genes, of course, it's the, um, the those that govern some of the biggest decisions for hiring and promotion. And I think if hiring committees, promotion committees, would commit to evaluating in ways that didn't, didn't get too allured. But, I mean, we all have seen that, oh, wow, science, nature. I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I'm attracted to that and not, not wanting to, but um, I think we have to do that there and also at the funder stage. So like the Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, these large funders, National Science Foundation, NIH, they can help address some of these issues. But what's happening interesting in the publishing world is that PNAS, which now has a you know, PNAS Nexus, and Nature has a whole flood of new journals, and science has a whole, like Nature Human, like nature human Behavior, Nature Communication, Nature, like there's Nature Everything using that brand, that as they grow, then it, it sucks us in. The gravity is even stronger for that. But ultimately, it comes down to you know, the full professors at a university um, being able to say, this is our, we're gonna evaluate based on the content. We're gonna only look at a certain amount of papers. And I know that's not completely new. It's like, you know, a lot of fields have been doing this for a long time, but I've talked to philosophers, for example, and they are kind of the worst uh, when it comes to really succumbing to this basket of journals and all the biases and prejudices that exist um, within their publication system. I, many are trying to address it, but I think we have to do it at the hiring and promotion and funding level. So anyway, I know that's easy, easier said than done and some are trying, but that might be the only way. Let's go here in the yeah. middle. So I think I understand how to think about media literacy when we're talking about like, um, like factual information. But what about when we're trying to teach people how to be media literate about politics, where there may not be a correct yeah. answer? It's like, is immigration or is insert topic right. good or bad? What are your thoughts? So here's you? how I address it. Over the years, I've realized that I shouldn't be focused at all on values and beliefs. In fact, a lot of times, and I learned this from my colleagues, Mike Koppel talking about this, that I don't care about your values. I do care, but I don't care. That's not what I care about, <laughs> your values and beliefs. What I do care, at least as a researcher, this is me as a researcher, as a person, I care very much Thank about you. 
that you're welcome. But as a researcher, I don't care about that. What I care about is to look at your claims and be able to put that claim in context to the rest of the literature. So if your claim actually counters uh, the, the literature by a vast amount, I can say, you know, you can still believe this, it might even be true down the line, but it's counter to whatever. So when we talk about issues around politics, if I can remove myself as far as I can as a researcher from those values and beliefs, which is very much what politics is about, then I can say we we might be able to be we might be able to be more productive in studying things like rumors because rumors can be true and they can be false. And we look at it in a way that's not so much about making some sort of normative claim about this is true or not. And, and there's everyone, everyone can find evidence. In fact, this is this is one of my sort of favorite things ringing in my head over the last you know, several months now is that there's infinite evidence on the internet. There's infinite evidence. You're always, you can find evidence for anything. Talk about the data voice. There's evidence everywhere. So it's, if we have to say that evidence isn't it, we need to have discussions about how you came to that evidence. If we can change the public conversation around how you came to that evidence and to make your argument even stronger, we might be able to at least address some of those issues. But anyway, it's, it's, that's a hard one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Shani, it seems like a lot of your work kind of hinges on this presumption that it's possible to teach people regular yes. humans to be identify yes. this information. And I, I want to say that I, I feel somewhat skeptical. And I'd like it if you could convince me, me to be more optimistic. It's going to be hard because I'm skeptical too. But yeah. <laughs> well, can I give you one or two? Yeah, I'll try. I'll skepticism. Try. Yes. And I would love it if you could respond yes. and make me feel better about this. Yes. So one piece of skepticism is that I remember from reading Thomas Kuhn a long time ago. So I hope you don't yes. ask me any questions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you, you got me on the simplest question of my whole thing, but I got anyway. Yes. <laughs> well, what I remember is that Kuhn told us that science progresses through paradigm shifts. Yeah. And a paradigm shift sounds a lot like what you were talking when, when you mentioned this counter consensus. And yeah. group of scientists and the the main group have holds some model about the world yeah. and eventually collapses under the weight of contradictory evidence. Right. And it seems to me that based on sort of the looking from the outside, the statistics that you're able to compile, it, it seems difficult to be able to distinguish maybe some counter consensus that, I mean, I don't know if you would agree with this. I, I don't know if they're operating in good faith from a true paradigm shift that might actually take hold. And another maybe bit of skepticism comes from sort of if, if I just reflect on some other theory that I have no personal knowledge about, say climate change. Yeah. And I, I tend to sort of accept right, broadly yeah. the fact that climate change is, is human, is caused by humans. But if I interrogate myself about how do I know that, it sort of ultimately comes down to trust. And I, I don't have, I, I imagine to actually form a knowledgeable opinion about whether which journals are even trustworthy to go to what experts are would take months and months to I'd probably have to- And, wait, and that's okay. you, imagine the public that's just like has a regular job, doesn't get the opportunity to work at a beautiful campus like this. Imagine them trying to dissect the, you know, what's a bad, what's a, you know, a journal I should trust. And which, in fact, I have this little post about, you know, uh, you know, how do you, you know, how do you determine a good journal? And it turns out it's really hard even for those that live in this all the time. Anyway, but, yeah. so it just, I mean, just, it just seems to me like a much more difficult task than, I don't know, checking some simple statistic, perhaps the journal influence that could itself be gained or, or, or something like that. It seems like if we can't really expect people to invest months and months of effort to, to try exactly. to Exactly. So I think if I understand your question, I want to make sure I got your question wrong. So you're what you're saying is that like in order for you to 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 go about maybe convincing them is to sort of in, you know teach them all of these different things about science, about these norms, about tiered journals, about like you know, reliability evidence, like, you know, there's, there is a tier system of evidence that, you know, you learn. I mean, I've even seen for the first time over the pandemic, more uses of RCTs than I've ever seen, you know, ever, in fact, they've even <laughs> weaponized RCTs, like, they'll say that, that that's not a good study because it doesn't have an RCT, and you're like, well, okay, you know, you can't, you can't have an RCT for everything, um, and so what can we do? I, I, I mean, the long-term play is to do a better job of teaching these social aspects of science, which is not how it's taught, at least in my view, um, when we teach science in the youngest levels in K-12 and below, we just sort of say, here's some, here's a fact to kind of memorize instead of here's how we came about it. We're sort of learning the social process and maybe there would be a way that we could do um, a better job engaging the literature if it wasn't always behind a paywall too. I think that is problematic. So how do you engage anyone on these topics if they can't even get access to this information? So I'm skeptical that we're going to be able to do this as well because of those challenges. And also people um, really, you know, once they've 
establish a narrative around the world, they can do their research like John Stockton did, and they go about finding evidence to support their theory. Um, and what I found is it's actually not that far away from what we do when we do reviews and everything. They sort of take a set of articles. They don't know the difference between, the, I mean, not to say that they don't know, but I mean, sometimes we don't know either. So anyway, I, I guess, I don't know if I fully answered it, but I would just say that I fully agree with you on the skepticism. I, all I, all I can say from what we learned is that those that were like in the consensus on an issue and those that were counter consensus, and this is only, we only looked at past in that case, and we're going to look at it in other things, that they both used almost the same techniques and the same literature, even, which shows how difficult it's going to be. Anyway, so I agree with you. Yes. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to what you were saying about values. Um, and it, it feels like most people care about science in that it can inform their values or, or you know, how I should uh, view the world or how I should behave in the world. And so, based on you're saying, based on science, that can inform yeah, that inform yeah, yeah, Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's what like people look for in science, right? It's like, should I should I smoke cigarettes? Are cigarettes bad for me? Or like, and it, yeah, I mean, um, it's an example like that, right? Uh, and I guess like, if we want to shift the conversation to this like evidence based like values free mode of like, um, what are the claims that I want to you know, support or refute. It feels like you need to discourage people from asking those sorts of like values centered questions or to change their framing around that. And I, I'm thinking back to like that like consensus website, right? Uh, where like people just like ask questions about science. Right. And yeah. then like get responses. Like, do you think there's a flaw there where you need to like actively push back and like maybe this is the wrong question to be asking that's a great point um uh yes i think yeah because actually the way you frame a question with any of these question and answer systems especially these more sophisticated ones you're right can sort of govern you in a place in the answer space that actually will then be misinformed even if it's actual useful uh, like well peer-reviewed literature because we can get because as one thing i've learned over the years is that you can take good research that has high integrity and still come up with a completely different narrative. So I guess that your point is you're right, that maybe we need to be thinking about not just the output, but also the sort of the ways in which the question itself sort of pushes it off in different ways that can affect what someone finds, but also can affect their values in some ways. So yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And I, uh, at this point, I'm not, I don't know. Well, I, I, that's a, another one of these things I'll have to keep thinking about. I'm thinking about it as you say it. So anyway, I'll, I'll, let's keep talking about it. That's a, that's a good question. Thank you. A very interesting conversation. So um, could you provide uh, your definition of science? And do you think uh, this definition should apply differently for science in the academic setting versus the industrial setting, for example? And the reason that I ask is because, like uh, it was mentioned, the incentives are different. So the cost benefit analysis is different. In the academic setting, for example, the benefit is knowledge, yeah. right? So the cost is if, if the study wasn't uh, done in the right way, it would be retracted. In, 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 this, in, in the industrial setting, the benefit would be for a company, a product to sell. And it, the, the cost would be if that product doesn't work, uh, the company would be sued. So um, uh, you mentioned uh, health misinformation. And for example, Pfizer does hold the record for uh, the largest financial uh, penalty for medical fraud. So what is your definition of science and, and how do we address this misinformation when it, it actually comes from a company? Yeah, so I guess the question that you're asking is, you know, first of all, what's my definition? I'll give you my definition, but then how that might differ um, between com you know a company and you know a research lab or a university, right? Given that the incentives are They're, the incentives are different. They're very, yeah. very different. Um, so first of all, I think of science as you know in its simplest form, a form of inquiry that adheres to evidence. Uh, you know, it's very, it's very much attached to evidence, where that uh, you know, your sort of initial idea of, of some observation in nature can change based on that evidence. So it's it's malleable. It's based. It's a form of inquiry, and there's evidence. Those are kind of the key components. And I think those would adhere to both industry and academia. But 
you might not like we have a longer term horizon within research industry probably has a shorter one because of the need to get things out quicker um you have i mean we know because scientists themselves are very motivated by money and, and paying mortgages and things like that that i think um you know it's probably you know on supercharged within industry and so yeah i think the incentives i think the incentives I guess I can actually find more similarities in a lot of those because a scientist really does need to get things out so they can get their job because they can get you know hired and then have these great jobs. Industry needs to get these results. But I guess um, you know if you're in industry and you found a negative result, what you might do, how you navigate that process might be different than a researcher on campus because there you can at least move to you know you know if you find that. You know, oxycotton doesn't work so uh, that that actually is very addictive. Um, you might start behaving in different ways than you would maybe on campus. So anyway, and a lot of people have written about this. Um, yeah, I'm happy to give you a bunch of references on this. But it's a good question. And yeah, a Margaret. question yes. from online yeah. from actually Professor Nilafar Salehi. Thanks for the really interesting talk. There have been quite a few high-profile scientific fraud and retractions happening through people blogging on the internet. Are there ways for retractions or corrections to happen more systematically? What would be the relevant institutions? Well, yes. So absolutely. They, and actually, we have another PhD student that we just were chatting before about doing some of this exact work. But I think Retraction Watch is not enough. So those that don't know about Retraction Watch, there is a website and an organization. It's been funded, fortunately, but it can go. the funding can go away at any time. They keep track of some of these things. Um, but there needs to be a better way. Um, and actually, there's been some improvements. So anyone who uses um, uh, any of like some of the reference managers, like Zotero, for example, will give you a notification if something's been retracted in your library. That, to me, that technical solution is one of the best ones I've heard. That may be the best systematic way. But journals need to do a better job. They can't just put blue boxes and red boxes up there and say this paper has been retracted. They need to put a big X. They need to put like, uh, please, you know, don't cite for these reasons. Um, they also need to allow authors to make changes because authors make mistakes, honest mistakes. We've all made mistakes. I've made mistakes. And it's so darn hard for the publishers to make changes when they, something has happened. That's not a change in a, the digital world. Why is it hard for journalists? Even publishers just aren't motivated or, or incentivized in ways to do this, but they need to make it easier for even an author to, to do that retraction. The other thing is we need to also not make it so sh a, a social shaming exercise. So if someone retracts, that's a good thing. I don't know if they have to retract a thousand articles a day. I mean, maybe that says something and maybe they should do a different, something different, but I think they should, that, that, that would allow it to be more systematic. So I think there's a whole bunch of things we can do, but we certainly need to do, and funders could list these things, but ultimately where these things are deposited at universities and archives and, and the DUIs need to follow that retraction better because there are plenty of studies and there's studies going on, I think even in the school right now, they're looking at the ways in which citations keep coming in the affirmative. And that, something like that has to change because we have enough complicated challenges in this area. This is an easier one, but it's not. So, okay, quick, I saw a hand over here. Okay. okay. Oh, yes. Uh, this is the second of your talks I've heard in a week, and I appreciate them both very much. Uh, I wouldn't be here if I didn't appreciate the first one. Uh, <laughs> but in, in both cases, you lost the appreciation for the <laughs> in both cases, just for, for food for thought, I've had a similar reaction, and that is the the way uh, the term science comes up in your yeah. your talks. Uh, seems to be used in a more uh, black and white way uh, than uh, I'm accustomed to hearing it. In other words, you seem very confident about things that are scientific and they're, at least in their aspirations, what where they are, and then there's a line and then there's other kinds yeah. of stuff. Uh, and then there's a concomitant question, mm -hmm. what constitutes relevant evidence as distinct from some other kind of evidence or something right. like that? Uh, and you, I think it's important to ask: uh, Is astro, you know, do we really have si uh, consensus about these matters? Is astrophysics a science? Uh, most of us probably say yes, but maybe because we don't know much about astrophysics. Uh, is um, uh, is geology a science? Well, it's supposed to be. Um, so maybe that's close to some border, but not transgressing it. Is history a science? Well, you can get in a lot of trouble in history uh, 
for getting it wrong, uh, but maybe it's not the same kind of wrong as in astrophysics. I, I don't know. These, these things are not open and shut questions. And um, uh, a fortiori in the case of what constitutes relevant evidence. It, I know more about this in social science, which is sort of where I belong. Uh, the frequency with which relevance is redefined is just enormous. Uh, so, uh, you know, a question like what uh, caused the civil war? It's not that we're ignorant about what caused the civil war. We know lots of stuff that right. was implicated. This has been in the national news. I was going to say, it's just this is a national story. Uh, but people will never agree, American historians will never agree isometrically on what caused the civil war. But we certainly know a lot of things that probably didn't cause the civil wars, many of which probably were once suspected of having done so. So there's a uh, there's a kind of continuum, or maybe not a continuum. There there are a variety of, of relationships between different things that get called science and evidence. Um, and I, I I think it will be helpful to develop much more nuance. I, I'm criticizing something I'm part of myself here to develop much more nuanced concepts of success and failure in a lot of these things. I, I couldn't agree more. And that's why I actually we just um, uh, brought in a philosopher of uh, epistemology and science into our center to help exactly with this sort of thing. Because I, I think there has to be more nuance. And I do, um, I'm glad you called me out for that because I do, I do kind of treat it as a binary sometimes. Like here's science and here's society. Like there, there's just like, it's much more, complicated than that. And actually, one thing that your comment ignited in, in my head is um, something that I've been talking to one of my PhD students a lot about. Instead of talking like about misinformation, uh, whether it's in science or society, we've started to focus more on this issue of disagreement. So disagreement, so you can have like disagreement um, is something that, you know, we're trying to figure out whether that uh, is a requirement of anywhere you see misinformation, but not sufficient. Um, and so we've been thinking a little bit about that, you know, in that lens, and then that's forced us to add some nuance to how we think about science and discussions of science, especially at that border of science and society, because that's where we study a lot of these things on social media. So, but yeah, and, uh, you know, as a quick response, I, I couldn't agree more, and I think it would do good service to how we talk about it to the public and also the research that we do to have a little more nuance in that binary treatment, because you're right, it's, it's a worthy of the call. Well, we're past the time okay. allocated, so let's let's thank Jeb and maybe you can talk a little yes, bit. Yes, I can take out. Thanks for